We start at, uh, in 2006, April 5th, 2006. This is central Louisiana. Uh, this is dash cam video from a police car. And it says on the dash cam readout, you see on the lower right there, that it was 113 degrees Fahrenheit that day. I do not think that's right. Uh, it was a hot day that day, uh, but it wasn't that hot. Uh, what's happening in this dash cam video, though, is that the police officer there, uh, the guy in the uniform on the left, he has just been advised a couple of hours earlier uh, that a nearby maximum security federal prison had had an escape. Uh, so this police officer in the video and every other police officer in the region is out looking for the escapee from the federal prison. And they come across this guy in the white tank top there. Uh, they come across him jogging along a railroad track. The guy is carrying no ID. He vaguely at least matches the physical description of the man who has just escaped from the federal prison nearby. And this encounter between the police officer and that man who was jogging by the railroad track, it lasts for about 10 minutes. And you might expect that to be sort of a stressful encounter, right? Uh, for the officer looking for the escapee and for this guy who he stopped. In this case, though, this interaction wasn't stressful at all. What's your address? I don't have an address. I'm at the hotel. We're working on uh, houses and stuff like that, the roofing. Roofing? Yep. Okay. For my brother. All right. <sighs> um, what is, we got an escapee. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Where from? Uh, prison. There's a prison here? Hey, just call. Subject wear glasses. Nothing about glasses. Can you find out? I'm out with a white male on the tracks. I guarantee you I'm not. No you know the bad thing about it? What's that? You're matching up to him. Come on. <laughs> well, that sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that, that sucks. Uh, the guy that police officer was speaking to was the escapee from that federal prison. Uh, the cop did stop him that day, the day of the escape. He did talk to him for about 10 minutes. Uh, the guy did recognize, the police officer did recognize that this guy matched the escaped convict's description, but they talked for about 10 minutes and he let the guy go. And that says something kind of remarkable about the cop in that situation. But lest you think that the cop was, you know, only the, you know, the only one to blame here, it should, it should be noted that the guy who he was dealing with was really, really good at escaping all sorts of law enforcement situations. That guy who was jogging along the railroad tracks that day, he had escaped from federal prison that day. He had escaped from maximum security federal prison. But that was the third time that he had escaped from prison or jail. The first time was in Minot, North Dakota in 1988. He'd been arrested on suspicion of murder. He was in a room with three detectives. They had handcuffed him to a chair, but he had a tube of lip balm in his pocket. He somehow, with his hands handcuffed and the three detectives in the room with him but not paying very close attention, he somehow reached into his pocket, got the lip balm out, used it to grease up his wrists, slipped out of the handcuffs, and then ran out of the room with the three detectives chasing him. And he got away. That was his first time. He ran away. He ran five blocks. I stole a car, drove until the car stalled out, hid out in an apartment building in Minot, North Dakota. A long article about this guy in The New Yorker later explained that it was actually a reporter from the Minot Daily News who saw him sneaking into that apartment building after his escape that day. That reporter called the police, told him where the guy was. When the police got to the apartment building, the guy climbed out of a window and leapt into a tree. And it was only because he couldn't hold on to the tree limb that he fell and they were able to take him back into custody but he had escaped from that county jail. His next stop and his next escape was from the North Dakota State Prison. That happened in 1992. In that case, he somehow got himself into a ventilation duct at the state prison in North Dakota. He wriggled his way free to the outside. In that case, they did not catch him right away. He was on the lam for 10 months before they found him again, but they did eventually find him. And then the next place he got locked up and the next place he escaped from was the federal prison in Pollock, Louisiana, maximum security federal prison, having escaped from two other facilities already by the time the feds had him. A, they must have been prepared to watch for him to be an escapee. 
And B, he must have been casing the joint immediately. He must have been casing the joint the whole time that he was there before he finally figured out how he was going to get out of that federal prison, too. The way he escaped from that federal prison is intrepid. Uh, he got himself a job at one of the, the prison industries at that facility, which was repairing and sewing mailbags for the U.S. Postal Service. Somehow, in the course of doing that prison job, he figured out a way to mail himself out of the prison. He sealed himself up in one of those mailbags, and he basically got himself mailed to freedom. He got into a mailbag and mailed himself out of the prison to a nearby warehouse. Then he busted out of the mailbag that he had sealed himself into, got himself an energy drink somewhere, and took off jogging down the railroad tracks on the way to his 10-minute-long, hilarious encounter with Officer Barney Fife. Put yourself in my position. Well, yeah, but I'm not. <laughs> I know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you throwing you against her. Hey, you wouldn't believe what them guys do. Okay. I mean, they got years and years to think about how they're going to do it. Now, I could, uh, when I crossed the tracks down there, I saw you running. I said, well, how lucky can I be? <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm not no prison escapee. You'd have done run by now. <laughs> you know that yourself. <laughs> yeah. You'd have done run by now. Yeah, you didn't. No, he didn't run. That would be too obvious. Instead, he stood there speaking in an accent that was not at all his own, uh, making small, friendly, uh, small talk, friendly small talk with that cop for about 10 minutes, and then the cop let him go, told him to be careful when he was along the railroad tracks, warned him he might get stopped again. That was in 2006. That guy who escaped from all those different facilities, including that federal prison that day, his name is Richard Lee McNair. And after he got away from the Minot County Jail and after he got away from the North Dakota State Penitentiary, Penitentiary and after he got away from that federal maximum security prison in Louisiana, and after he got away from that cop detaining him by the railroad tracks, he did stay out for a while. He did live free for another year and a half after that dash cam video was shot. And they eventually caught up to him 18 months after he broke out of that prison in Louisiana. They caught up with him 18 months later. He was in Canada. I have no idea how he got from central Louisiana up to northern New Brunswick, but that's where they caught him in October 2007. Mostly it seems like they caught him because the homemade tint job he did on the windows of the vehicle that he'd stolen, the, the tint job was so hoopty that the New Brunswick cops thought that was reason enough to pull him over and check to see who this guy was in the hoopty tint job car. Richard Lee McNair has a long history as an accomplished escape artist. He made his way out of a U.S. penitentiary last year by hiding himself inside a package of mailbags and mailing himself to freedom. He's been on the run ever since until yesterday. Uh, police here in Campbellton spotted a suspicious van driving around the city, and what tipped them off was the fact that all the windows on the van were tainted black. They asked the van to pull over. They asked the driver to step out. Turns out it was Richard Lee McNair. He escaped on foot and ran for about 400 meters before police caught up with him and arrested him. This guy was an amazing escape artist, Richard Lee McNair. I mean, terrible guy, right? Convicted murderer. But he escaped everywhere they locked him up. He got, got away 400 meters running from the Canadian cops at the end. I mean, he would escape, get caught, escape, get caught, escape, get caught. And that's the thing here, though. I mean, no matter how good you are at escaping, no matter how amazing the escape, no matter how much skill or luck or audacity or violence goes into the escape, these guys who escape, they always get caught. In 2009, it was a prison in Michigan City, Indiana. Three prisoners tunneled all the way out of the cell block and underneath the prison yard, they got out. They lasted a few days before all three of them were recaptured. 2008, it was the Curry County lockup in New Mexico. Eight guys escaped all at once in Curry County, eight of them. They shimmied up pipes inside the prison walls, and then they popped out through the prison roof. Eight guys all escaped all at once, all of them eventually recaptured. In 1999, it was a rare escape from death row. Four prisoners escaped from death row at the Louisiana State Pen. They smuggled in hacksaw blades and hacksawed through the bars and doors of their cells. Those guys didn't even make it off the prison grounds before they were recaptured. Even the amazing, famous, daring helicopter rescues, right? the helicopter escapes, those guys, those guys get caught too. Uh, this one was a year ago today. Remember this one in Quebec? Helicopter landed on the prison grounds, picked these guys up off the prison yard and flew away. That was in Quebec a year ago today. Those guys got caught within a couple of weeks. They were all back in the prison from which they escaped using that helicopter. 
The last escape in New York State was in 2003 from a maximum security prison in Elmira, New York. Two convicted murderers from that prison in just an incredibly complex plot. They got sledgehammers and other tools to bust holes in the ceiling of their cell. And then they made these amazing dummies, uh, these realistic looking dummies, and they propped the dummies in their beds so it looked like they were sleeping in their beds when the corrections officers came to check on them during the night. They, sh they shimmied up uh, and out, out of the prison through the ventilation shafts in Elmira in 2003. They still had to get over the walls of the prison after they got out of the ventilation shaft, though. For that, they used torn bed sheets that they'd fashioned into a rope. But because of the makeup of that facility and because of what they had to do to get out, the rope they made with bed sheets was 61 feet long. That was amazing, right? That must have taken them months, if not years, to plan that escape from that maximum security facility in Elmira, New York in 2003. But even with all of that planning and all of that complexity and the success that they got out, they were both back in custody within two days. They get caught. As much thought and effort and cunning goes into your average maximum security prison escape, it seems like it's really never a long-term victory. These guys get caught. But right now, we are in that fraught interregnum between the time when two maximum security prisoners were discovered missing from their cells at 5.30 Saturday morning, where between that time and what everybody expects will be the news of their inevitable capture somewhere in upstate New York or maybe across the border in Canada. One of the two men who escaped is named David Sweat. He's 35 years old. He's serving life without parole for the 2002 killing of a deputy sheriff, a man who he shot 22 times and ran over reportedly while the deputy was still alive. The other escapee is 49-year-old Richard Matt, who's serving 25 to life for murdering and dismembering a man near Buffalo, New York. After that murder, but before he was arrested for that murder, Richard Matt fled to Mexico. While he was in Mexico, he killed another man there. He was arrested in Mexico, served nine years in a Mexican prison for that killing before getting extradited back to the U.S. to face trial for the earlier murder in Buffalo. But this guy, Richard Matt, he too has a history, not just an incredibly violent criminal history. He has a history of not just, just fleeing before he could be arrested in that original murder trial. He also has a history of having escaped from custody. In 1986, the same guy, Richard Matt, he was in jail in Erie County, New York, on forgery charges. He escaped from that Erie County jail. He got out of his cell when a guard mistakenly popped the electronic lock on his cell door. He then scaled a nine-foot-tall brick and metal wall that was topped with razor wire. And then he climbed an eight-foot-tall wire gate. He got himself all cut up in the process of getting out, but he got out. He spent five days at large before he was captured again. But now he's out again. And now this massive manhunt is underway around the Clinton Correctional Facility in Dannemora, New York, just 25 miles south of the Canadian border, up in the Adirondacks. The focus is on figuring out now how these two convicted murderers were able to escape from Clinton, how they apparently got power tools, which they used to saw through their cell walls that allowed them to get out of the cell block and into a steam pipe that led into a nearby neighborhood where they popped out in the middle of the street through a manhole cover. The focus in Dannemora now is, is figuring out how they got out. And there's also the rather pressing question of whether or not they had help. There are some reports today that a female employee who worked inside the prison might have been involved somehow in the escape effort. So figuring out how they did it, figuring out how it happened, figuring out how to stop it from happening again, and whether there is some huge security breach on staff at that maximum security prison, that's job one, right? Actually, no, that's job two. Uh, because tonight, these two convicted murderers are still on the loose. They were first discovered missing Saturday morning. They're still out there now. So job one is finding them. If past is prologue, they will be found. It's just a question of when. Joining us now from just outside the Clinton Correctional Facility, where these two prisoners escaped this weekend, is Jesse McKinley. He's a reporter at The New York Times. Mr. McKinley, thank you very much for your time tonight. Of course, thank you. Uh, what can you tell us about the, the status of the... Uh, investigation and the specifically the search, how they're trying to find these guys and how it's going? Well, I mean, it's ongoing. There's been, uh, there's been rumors flying all day long about various places where these people may have been seen about a half an hour ago, in fact, just about a block and a half from here. Uh, there are a number of law enforcement agents who actually entered a house in a barn. Uh, there was a helicopter in the air overhead. Um, they don't seem to have found anything, but, it, you know, it's, it's one of these situations where Apparently, police have received over 300 leads. 
uh, they're trying to track these down, but you know that's a painstaking process, and sorting the wheat from the chaff, I think, is taking a little while. Uh, at the same time, there's an investigation ongoing inside the prison behind me uh, as to how exactly these guys did this. Uh, there, there have been some reports today that there's at least uh, the possibility that somebody who worked inside the prison uh, might have helped them in some way. Can you put any more meat on those bones in terms of uh, whether or not that allegation seems credible? Yeah, we were able, at the times we were able to confirm that today, that there, there is an investigation as to a female employee who may have had some sort of relationship, uh, it's not clear what kind of relationship, with one of the inmates, uh, Richard Matt. Uh, beyond that, there's not a lot of details. There are, there's some talk that she may work in the laundry room of the facility. Uh, with a maximum security like prison like this behind me, you're, you're talking about several thousand uh, prisoners, but you're also talking about an enormous number of support staff. You know, you've got people that do the laundry and, and, and do janitorial services and vocational training and, and all sorts of things that kind of go into a, a prison of this size. So there's a lot of interaction between prisoners and civilians. Uh, and in this case, they, uh, the investigators at least feel that perhaps one of these relationships went too far and that perhaps she may have facilitated the escape. In terms of the way they got out, um, we've seen a lot of, uh, frankly, just up close pictures of the actual uh, means by which they got out of their cells and that steam pipe that they went through. Is it clear to authorities right now what kinds of tools they needed, what kinds of tools they used, and how they would have been able to get access to those kinds of tools from, from that cell block? If, if it's clear to authorities, they're not making it clear to us. Uh, but in talking to people that kind of know those cuts, actually, interestingly enough, if you look at the photographs, you can kind of see the way that the cuts go along the, uh, along the wall, the cell block wall, as well as with the, the pipe that they crawled through. Uh, I talked to a couple of guys that said that, that was probably some sort of grinder, a metal grinder, uh, which, uh, which was used to kind of make those very precise cuts. This was not a sloppy job. They, they knew what they were doing uh, when they were making the cuts. As to how they got the equipment, that is, that is a major ongoing point of the investigation. Um, there is, uh, once again, this is a huge facility behind me, and there was a lot of construction going on in that facility uh, at the time. There were construction crews, independent construction crews coming and going, so there's some theory that perhaps one of these uh, contractors was either in on it or uh, kind of haphazardly left a piece of equipment behind that was then used to cut these holes. Jesse McKinley, a reporter with the New York Times outside the Clinton Correctional Facility in Danamore, New York. Thanks for helping us understand this. It's really helpful to have you here. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. It's interesting. You know, the, yes, there have been maximum security escapes before, but there aren't so many that there's a clear protocol as to what happens here, right? I mean, there's the town of Danamora has a smaller population than the prisoner population at that very large, very old prison up there up uh, by the Adirondacks and up against the Canadian border. Uh, to see the scale of the mobilization to find these guys uh, is just I mean, it's, it's an impressive response. Until they find them, it won't be impressive enough. Uh, but again, if past is any prologue on these things, these guys will be found. We don't know how long they'll be on the lam. They've already been out a couple of days, but they will be found uh, if history is any guide here. All right, lots more ahead tonight. Stay with us.